I'm here with Rob High, IBM fellow, and you're now the CTO of the Watson Project, correct? That's right. That's right. Great. Well, this is um, it's a good opportunity. Uh, everybody who's followed what I'm doing knows how interested I am in Watson and, and how excited I am about what you're putting together. I wanted to get some thoughts on, uh, since you've come into this role, it's it's obviously new for you because Watson is, is relatively new for the company. What, what have been the biggest surprises or challenges uh, for you personally in your role as CTO for Watson? So two, two categories of challenge that um, uh, I think I didn't expect coming in. First of all, um, and, this, and the first of these actually goes both ways, because when we first came together, I spent a lot of time with the research organization, spent a lot of time, of course, with the engineering team, uh, and understanding sort of the mechanics of how Watson worked. And during that sort of initial educational period, I came away um, with a strong impression about the adaptation methodology and the difficulties of ensuring that we were able to identify all of the features of language that were relevant and prevalent in, in the everyday use of the language, and ensuring that Watson could, be, could, could appropriately um, distinguish um, all those features for the sake of answering questions. And so um, I went about actually preparing the organization to be fairly strict about the methodology for adaptation uh, and ensure that we had the right kind of specialists in place to be able to handle that. And we did. And we put together the team and we reorganized some of the existing engagements and offerings to make better use of that methodology and to get better alignment around a common set of algorithms that we use within the system to be able to detect these features. Having done so, the flip side of this is um, now that we've got a common pipeline and we've adapted and adopted fairly um, rigorous adaptation methodology, Watson has proven to be incredibly resilient to a really wide set of variation in linguistics. Mm -hmm. uh, much more so than I think we ever anticipated. The effect that we, you know, we were expecting from that, um, I think, was much more modest than we're actually seeing. Uh, and so, as we go into new engagements, we're actually into new scenarios with existing engagements where we're bringing in, if you will, new features of the domain, uh, different, you know, different uh, kinds of language. That, for example, in the healthcare industry, you know, that, that surrounds different kinds of diseases, et cetera. Watson is picking up on those variations and really, uh, with very little reduction in accuracy, uh, recognizing almost immediately what the intent of the question is and be able to provide the right answer for that. Um, so that has been a, both a surprise going in with respect to how much work that I thought we were going to have to do and put in place. And also, counter to that, a tremendous surprise with respect to the impact that that has had on expanded resiliency of Watson and around language. Um, I think the other surprise is um, I, always, I always expect, and I continue to expect to a large extent, that where Watson works well is, is, is uh, in business processes, they're reasonably well established, but where we're now adding the additional dimension of being able to process the unstructured information, personal information that people operate with within those environments. But because they are part of otherwise established business processes, I'm always surprised to the extent that people don't expect more of that business process automation to be integrated into Watson. As opposed to, um, as opposed to the the current predilection, which is to sort of add Watson onto existing automated processes. And maybe what I'm really saying there is that I really expected that in a lot of these processes there would already be a, a sort of a dearth of business process automation that we would that we would uh, have to then compensate for in order to get Watson to work well um, in those organizations. 
And the reality is that there is already a tremendous amount of process that has been automated. Now, maybe it's not using sort of modern process language as much as I would have expected for that automation. But nonetheless, it is there. It's in the form of the applications that have already been established. People know where the intersections are with these mentioned systems, and, and, and it's turning out to be much more natural for us to plug in what's into these processes than I ever anticipated. I really thought that we would have to do a lot more of that ourselves within the engagement. So those are sort of the two biggest surprises I've seen. Um, less of a surprise, but certainly something that I think we've come to realize is, is uh, I've gotten engaged into the overall awareness and understanding of what process or what, what uh, Watson is about and how to operate um, is the recognition that this notion that we can um, understand language with sort of human like fidelity, right. um, you know, this, this notion of what we refer to as a cognitive system, is not confined strictly to only the problems of understanding language. Language is a good example of where we apply cognitive processes. I'm sure there's plenty of psychologists who would argue that, in fact, all the foundation of our human cognitive processes is is language, that without language it would be difficult to think, it would be difficult to extrapolate, it would be difficult to reason or even to recognize and, and perceive. Um, I won't debate whether that's true or not, I don't really know, but I, what I do know is that you know this characteristic that you know, understanding language with human life fidelity and information system at scale is something that we can do for both language as well as other dimensions that we would normally associate with human cognition, such as perception, such as um, recognizing behavioral characteristics. You, know, mm -hmm. you and I, if we're in a conversation with somebody, we can tell through body language, we can tell through... Um, the interaction, not just at the language level, but just sort of at the way in which the interaction gets fragmented or coalesced or takes a diversion or not, whether somebody is engaged in that conversation or perhaps not just not engaged. Right. And you know that human quality that allows us to recognize that of each other is a very useful concept when it comes to applying cognition and cognitive processing within an information system. Because if we can do that with customers, for example, that are interacting with our business products, if we can, as part of that interaction, recognize whether the person who's using those business products is truly engaged in the business product or uh, is only marginally involved or only um, involved because they have to be, we yeah. can make that distinction, right? Then it would inform a lot um, of you know, the business. It would inform the business a lot about what they ought to be doing next, right? How did they draw their customers back into being more viscerally engaged with uh, the business and, and what they're doing? So I think this is just an example of all the places where we can apply this notion of cognitive systems processing. Beyond merely the task of understanding the languages, the language, for the sake of answering questions, for example. Yeah, that's as you're going through that and talking about language. One of the things that I'm thinking is you're speaking with your hands a lot. Yeah. As I yeah. do, yeah. and you know, one of the reasons that we're doing this by Skype video instead of just Skype audio is that richness of communications. Yeah, yeah. So I would be very curious, and you know, going back uh, many years, my undergrad was in psychology, and I remember we had you know classes in, uh, in learning, and, and perception was a big one. Um, yeah. So it was, you know, psychology, basically a vision, and lots of things that, uh, that I barely remember from class, yeah. but yeah. I know that we don't capture in most... Yeah. Um, machine learning systems. Yeah. So is yeah. there anything there in terms of um, sort of that additional dimension of vision that you're looking at or that you can speak to in terms of Watson somewhere down the road? Well, so, so I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that, in fact, you're, you, you pointed out this, 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 this comment about 
um, hand gestures. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably not coincidental that we refer to that as body language. Right. I mean, to some extent, we do express ourselves through our motion and physical behavior and, and interactions. It is part of our language. The visual yep. dimension is is additive. It really does complement and enrich um, the exchange of information in ways that are hard to capture in pure textual form. And so, um, you know, there is lots of places where I think that we need to bring this notion of cognitive computing and to capture these additional dimensions of both language. As well as, I'm not even sure I'm quite ready to call it language, even though we do refer to it as body language. There's a subtleness underneath that. There's a subtleness in the information of our words. There's a subtleness in the um, in the in, in the energy levels that we yep. um, use in our expression, and um, whether that can be converted strictly into a language, or whether there's something um, about that that goes beyond language. You know, again, I won't debate because I'm not an expert in those characteristics, but I will at least observe that there's a lot of similarities between that and the type of things that we've done in terms of breaking down the features of language for the purposes of understanding that we could then apply to these other visual dimensions, um, auditory dimensions, uh, yep. energy level dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that, that <clears throat> opens up a lot of opportunities for things. Uh, one of my thoughts was... Uh, it was almost in jest. I was going to say that I think that cognitive computing is the future and always will be in my lifetime. You know, there's going to be that thing. So I was wondering which um, which areas of Watson's current capabilities you expect to see the most advances in the next few years. So uh, we've really focused on nat on language processing or natural language processing, which. Um, as you said, could be expanded to include a lot of other dimensions of language besides um, syntax and semantics, you know, other things that we can perceive. Um, we haven't talked about the, the deep QA or the hypothesis testing, you know, what other people would think of as machine learning, or even uh, on the hardware side, one of the things that um, really impressed me with the Jeopardy instance of Watson was how uh, the system managed to leverage, was it, 2,880 cores. That number sticks in my head because uh, I happened to be talking to uh, Dave Ferrucci the night of the, the Jeopardy win. I was like, yeah. how did you pick that? Why did you stop there? You know, why didn't you go to 10,000? And, and, you know, looking at it, it's pretty amazing to me just what you could do there. And I know that you've now, in the commercial instance that we're starting to see, what, uh, you and I were at, uh, at your New York event uh, with the healthcare announcements. Um, so you get it down to a single rack um, distribution, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. can you just give me a, a rough estimate? You, you talked about uh, your concern with getting the right team in place for language for the different domains that you were working with. How much of the effort to make this a commercial success? You're in healthcare now. We've we've seen that. We know that there are other um, things in the pipeline. To get it to where you want it to be in five years, how much of your effort is going to be language versus the deep QA end of things versus the actual optimization? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would say probably about half of our effort is going to be around the engineering, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of of um, you know doing the the continuing refinement. Around efficiency, yeah. which, which sort of has both the software component as well as you point out a hardware component. Uh, the software side of this is really just making sure that you know we've minimized the instruction path length, that we have you know maximized concurrency, that we have made the best use of the available resource in the most efficient way. Essentially, translating into both reducing footprint as well as increasing performance, um, response time, uh, and scale. So we spent a lot of time from the software side on that problem. We're also working very closely with um, the power systems right. organization in uh, finding optimizations within both the configuration of power systems as well as in future enhancements that we might expect to see in power systems that are tuned specifically for this kind of workload. 
so you know the buzzword is you know workload optimized systems, but it literally is that. It is working with the systems level of the information computing framework, all the way down to the instruction set, to, to the channel bandwidth and, yep. and buffering sizes, cache sizes, uh, I/O channel, uh, you know, cycle management, um, specialty engines, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that go to enabling at the hardware infrastructure systems level with this kind of workload, which is very you know data intensive. It, it, oh yeah. Uh, it, it's very data intensive, but it has a very heavy compute cycle intensive aspect to it as well, especially when it comes to doing statistical analysis and numerical analysis that goes on as the underpinnings of this larger stuff. So, you know, we're working very closely on that level and that front. And then, and then likewise, in the um, deployment uh, aspect. So today, you know, Watson is offered as a service. It's a, a software as a service. Yep. Uh, we host it, we manage it uh, on behalf of our clients. And, and we, as everybody who's in the business of software as a service, are highly motivated to get the best efficiency from the shared resources as possible. It's not just about having a machine right. dedicated to one client. It really becomes, you know, how many different, unique, isolated cases of that use can we enable in a multi-tenant fashion across yep. sort of shared resources. Uh, so those are our big engineering challenges is, is to evolve the system to be both more compact as well as more isolated and more tenant. Yeah. Um, I guess it was November, December. I actually um, got a nice tour of the East Fishkill, East Fishkill Fab where they make the power chips and had a, a good conversation with some of the... Um, the researchers there in terms of, you know, the the entire process. And it's no secret that um, IBM makes chips for other people and for most of the gaming systems. Uh, you know, I'm running a, uh, a MacBook Pro here, but I, I'm pretty sure I've got three IBM chips in my kids' various gaming systems, you know, around the, the house. For the... Watson instance, and I'm still looking for the right term here. You know, the the Jeopardy version, the um, offline, self-contained version. Uh, my understanding is that all the power um, boxes that that we saw in those racks were off the shelf. There was nothing that was custom made in hardware for Watson. As you get into some of these other advances um, with language. Do you think, is it foreseeable or am I uh, stretching it here, that you may find things that you need that then go into the power series uh, and find general use? Or are you sort of constrained or planning to stick with what's there and then optimizing in software? Well, the, the, the cycle of times around hardware change is always long. So we have to factor that into our thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no doubt that we're going to leverage and exploit what's there. But even within what's there, there is a degree of variation that we can um, tune, if you will, right. for this kind of workload. So you know, whether that is you know, the mix of memory versus DASD versus, versus you know, compute speed, whether that is adjusting cache size uh, and pre-allocation of of you know, page areas, you know, there are things that we can do even with the existing systems that allow yeah. us to dramatically affect the performance of the software in that system. Uh, but yeah, we're working with the power systems uh, organization uh, to look at future enhancements that could be made, not just for Watson as we know it today, but for our entire class of, of both cognitive and analytic-based workloads. Uh, that um, advantage anybody who's trying to deploy that kind of workload right. in a power system, uh, and where specifically advantage you know our clients where we're deploying cognitive systems to Watson. Cool. When we were at um, the New York announcements, I believe it was uh, Dr. Chris from Memorial Sloan Kettering who said um, that. 
in every instance where they had talked to doctors about using Watson as a diagnostic assistant, the the reaction was very positive. It was, you know, this is great. It's an addition. It's a colleague. It's it's not a replacement. There was no threat, right? And uh, I was happy to see that. And, and it, it doesn't actually surprise me because at that level of professionalism, you're dealing with someone who knows they have unique knowledge, but they know that they don't know it all. And they're in a position where welcoming something that can help them be more efficient makes sense. As Watson gets rolled out into other domains where it may make less um, less skilled or um, people with a lower training threshold more effective, I would expect to see that there may be some resistance and thinking that this is going to be a replacement. Have you run into that at this point, or is that uh, you? You've got so much on your plate right now with the higher end that you haven't uh, haven't reached that. We have not run into anybody who has reacted to Watson as as, as being a potential threat. Um, I think that there is a threat to their themselves or to their raw job or role or, or otherwise. And I think there's probably two parts to that. One is, I think. I think it's fair to say that, by and large, society, at least modern society, um, meaning societies in, that are exposed to a high density of you know, digital processing in the world, you know, and, right. and have access to electronic devices and, and whatnot, um, that a large segment of society has become preconditioned to expect computing be available to them to assist them and augment their life. Um, as simple as, you know, I don't, you know, if I, when I go home at night, my family, my entire family, my kids, my wife, my dog, mm -hmm. uh, you know, won't hesitate to get on, on the system, whether that is, you know, doing Google searches or Bing searches or any right. other kind of search engine or, you know, doing their homework, looking up, you know, materials that have been provided to them through school, uh, you know, finding information about, you know, some of the, you know, ailments that we encounter at home or, or simply trying to understand, you know, how to, to um, you know, find things to buy or, or find information that would help us understand, you know, areas and aspects of our life. We, we, we do this all the time and yeah. just sort of become comfortable with the idea that computers can assist us in this way. Yeah, and but at the same token, we also kind of suffer a certain level of frustration, even if we aren't conscious of that all the time. Where today, the state of the art of trying to access information in the computing system is largely a function that's been oriented around trying to train us as human beings on the best ways of getting the computer to do what we want them to do. Right. So, you know, if you're doing a search, um, we've all learned. Most of us have learned some better than others. You know how to take our question and convert it into a keyword, a set of keywords <laughs> that's most likely to yield yes. you know, the information that we're looking for. Um, and of course, we've all dealt with the cases where we didn't come up with quite the right combination of keywords, right. and what we ended up with was a list that is, you know, hundreds of pages long. But worse is that the information we were looking for was either on you know, the fifth or tenth or hundredth page, but even once we found it, we had to dig deep into the document to really read through and find the information we were looking for, or, and, and, and then on top of which, you know, there was a whole bunch of other documents that we either, by virtue of the title and the quick abstract to tell what the right title, wasn't the right document for us, right. so we still had to read one of those. Or worse, is we actually had to go into each of those documents, either discover that it was about something completely different, wasn't answering the question we were asking, it was telling us where the answer, the question came from or something, yeah. um, or, you know, or had a broken link or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we've been conditioned by the computing system on how to adjust ourselves and our own behavior and our own expression of need in a way that optimizes the execution of the 
of the computer. And what I think Watson offers is an experience that allows us to condition the computer to optimize our needs, to optimize the way that we express ourselves, to optimize around the way that we want to ask and describe our problem. And yep. you know, in much the same way that with you, you and I as human beings interact with, I wouldn't adjust necessarily, at least not in any significant way, to express my way my, myself to optimize your effectiveness. Yep. Um, we expect that of each other, that we're going to adjust each other and respond in the way that each of us individually naturally interact. So, you know, I think that's the dramatic shift that's occurring here is is computers as tools, not as a threat to our lives, but rather as convenience to our life in augmenting us and helping us find the information that we need, but in a way that's natural to us, right? That doesn't rely on us, you know, understanding how these computing systems work and figuring out the, you know, the decoder ring, uh, you know, approach to, you know, yep. getting them to work well. No, I think that's a great point. Um, we'll, we'll probably actually end the segment with that. That, <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's optimism, which is what I want to see, you know, when, yeah. I, when I look at this. 